in how we take it. My prayer uh, has been and lines up with what uh, I believe the Holy Spirit just prayed through Lucas too, uh, that, that we would uh, not just hear the Word of God tonight, but that we would cling to it. Like we would cling to the Word of God as if it were Jesus, because it is. It's His words. He is the Word. Um, and so if you'll, you'll turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 5, I'm going to read uh, some verses here, 6 through 11. And I always think a lot of times, you know, when we get together for worship, sometimes it can take a minute for us to kind of get to that place as we're going through different songs. But I, I just know that something special happens when we're all really singing to Jesus. When we're all united and really singing to Jesus, and so my hope and my prayer for uh, our communion time tonight would be that I'm going to read these verses in Romans chapter 5, 6 through 11, uh, and then, because uh, verse 11 specifically um, has just been heavy on my heart lately, um, and then we would spend our time just singing these songs. Uh, verse 11 says, we can now rejoice in our new relationship that we have with God um, and our friendship to, has been restored with God because of Jesus and what he's done on the cross, right? And so that we would spend our time really rejoicing in, in the relationship that we have with God, that we would spend our time rejoicing in our friendship that we have during worship and really singing to him. And so in Romans chapter 5, you know, it's talking about um, uh, now that we have peace with God and we've been made right with God, and we have this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we have this confidence and this joy as we look forward to sharing in God's glory. Then it goes into a few verses talking about uh, we can rejoice when we have troubles because of what Jesus has done and because it gives us endurance and endurance gives us strength of character and makes us more like Jesus, uh, makes us look forward to um, being with him forever. The Holy Spirit has filled our hearts, and then it picks up here in verse 6. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. So you see how that ties in? It's talking about, hey, now we can rejoice in troubles because we've been removed from the effects that they have. From Before, we were utterly helpless. When we had troubles of any kind, and we were always in trouble, um, and we, we had no way out, and we were utterly helpless and just being crushed under the weight uh, of the worries of this life, of our sin and everything else. And so when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us, while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now, we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he's made us friends with God. And I think that just all too often, we don't rejoice. We don't rejoice in our relationship with God. The, the, the joy of the Lord is our strength, right? And that means that the joy of having Jesus is where strength is found. And I think it's just too often we don't, it, it's kind of like when you talk about spiritual blessings or blessings, you know, and you go, thank God for your blessings. And if you don't put the word spiritual in front of it, you go straight to physical things. And yet when you look down in Ephesians chapter one, it's like we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, you know, adopted and forgiven and all these things and chosen and all this stuff that we should be rejoicing in because we have this wonderful new relationship with God. And so... Um, take a minute right now and remember when you were utterly helpless. Because if you forget when you were utterly helpless, that's why you're not rejoicing in your friendship with God now. And, and to have a friendship with God, to come to that place where you actually 
have surrendered to Jesus and you've experienced the new life of the Holy Spirit filling your heart and having this wonderful new relationship with God, you've had to come to a place where you knew you were utterly helpless. If you don't have that moment as you sit here right now, you probably don't really know Jesus. You probably haven't, haven't experienced the fullness of his life. And so remember when you're under the and some of you guys sitting here right now, right now's your moment. You even right now feel utterly helpless. Or maybe you're just being reminded of how utterly helpless you are apart from Jesus. And yet, at just the right time, Jesus died. And the right time is that moment when you realize you're utterly helpless apart from him and you actually need him. You're done trying to do things your own way. You know you're done playing God. So just for a moment, remember how utterly helpless you were. Remember how utterly helpless you are apart from Jesus. That he died for you at your worst. Not because you were valuable. But so that you could experience and have his value. <clears throat> that he died for you while you were his enemy. Not because he was lonely and needed friends. But because you were dead and needed life. And so now we have this wonderful new relationship with God. There's only one. The one and only living God. We have a wonderful new relationship. We're, we're able to be in a wonderful new relationship with God. And have a friendship with Him. <coughs> Not be His enemy anymore, but friends of God. Because of what Jesus has done on the cross. And so as we sing these songs, I'm praying and I hope that you will you will rejoice. You'll actually <coughs> rejoice as you sing right now. And you'll sing to Jesus like you're really thankful. For what he's done. Because I know when that happens, when we unite and we really rejoice and sing to Jesus, really sing to God and rejoice in this wonderful new relationship. I mean, that we have peace with God. Like, I don't know what else you could possibly need right now. I believe the Holy Spirit will come on this place in power. If we rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God. When we're done singing, we'll have a communion
was restored with him by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. By the blood of Jesus, we have been cleansed. We've been made holy. We stand before Jesus, blameless, without a single fault. And so we, we rejoice yeah. in the cross. Take communion. <clears throat> While they're passing the bowl to get the empty communion cups, if you want to, and uh, I hope you do, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 18. John chapter 18, we're going to be in verses 1 through 11. Like I said, my prayer for us tonight has been simple but powerful. That we would not just hear the word of God, but that we would cling to it. Like someone in the middle of the ocean, that the word of God would be like our life preserver. We would cling to it in that way. We would cling to it for dear life. John chapter 18, starting verse 1. <clears throat> After saying these things, Jesus crossed the Kidron Valley with his disciples and entered a grove of olive trees. <clears throat> Judas, the betrayer, knew this place because Jesus had often gone there with his disciples. The leading priests and Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards to accompany him. Now with blazing torches, lanterns, and weapons, they arrived at the olive grove. Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him, so he stepped forward to meet them. Who are you looking for, he asked. 
Jesus the Nazarene, they replied. I am, Jesus said. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. As Jesus said, I am, they all drew back and fell to the ground. Once more he asked them, who are you looking for? And again they replied, Jesus the Nazarene. I told you I am, Jesus said. And since I am the one you want, let these others go. He did this to fulfill his own statement. I did not lose a single one of those you have given me. Then Simon Peter drew a sword and slashed off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest's slave. But Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering the Father <clears throat> has given to me? Let me pray for us. Lift your hearts with me. <coughs> Lord Jesus, we ask that you would accomplish all you want to through your word tonight. Ask Holy Spirit that you would be here in a heavy way, that your presence would be made known through heavy conviction, um, that we would be strengthened <coughs> Uh, encouraged and comforted by your word tonight. Uh, we would be set on solid ground and steadied along as we walk out of here. Jesus, we know that your word is alive and powerful. We know that it also performs heart surgery. So we sit here right now realizing there's some surgery you want to do in us as we sit here right now tonight. <coughs> and so we surrender and submit to that. We completely surrender and submit to your will, your way, knowing your ways are far beyond our ways. Um, we ask, Lord Jesus, that you would make us more like you. And we would fully embrace, just like you do in this passage, what you've called us to be as your followers. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name. <clears throat> so before we get into the message, I couldn't help but notice here. Um, so it says, after saying all these things, once again. And so, um, John chapter 17 Jesus has just uh, prayed his dying prayer with his disciples. And so after all the things that he said that we went over the last couple weeks, he prayed that God's glory would be first, right? That God's glory would be made known, that he would be glorified on the cross, lifted high, that God would receive glory, um, that, that uh, his glory would be our priority. We went through this that, um, you know, uh, last week... Um, Last week we dove into um, the unity that we're supposed to have as followers of Jesus, this perfect unity. Uh, lots of people I've talked to since then are still trying to wrap their minds around that. Uh, I think it's more of a heart thing, right? And the mind will follow. But there's this perfect unity that Jesus prayed for us that we would have that would be proof that he was alive. It would be proof that he came and that he died on the cross. And, and then there's this other thing in here that Jesus talked about us being sanctified, us being made holy by his truth, by his word. That's why my prayer has been so simple for us tonight, is that we would hear the word of God, we would cling to it, and we would be sanctified, we would be made holy, we would be made more like Jesus. So after saying all these things, after Jesus praying this dying prayer, right, he crosses over and he heads into the garden. And I'm not going to hit the garden because it's not in the text tonight. I could go there and we could look at the other Gospels and look at what happened in the garden. But I just want to focus on what's happening here in these, uh, these first 11 verses. But I couldn't help but notice that they came looking for Jesus like he was Shrek. Right? <laughs> they came looking for Jesus like he was Frankenstein, right? This is what it looks like when you come looking for a monster. And they came with lanterns and torches <laughs> and weapons. And, and I'm looking at this right now as I'm standing here. And, uh, you know, I, I just can't help but notice, like, Jesus came, like, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son to die for us, for these people right here. And they come with blazing torches and weapons. Right? That he didn't come to judge the world but to save it. 
Like, that's how he's dealing with us and these people, and they come with these blazing torches and stuff. And so, um, this, this, it's, okay, so when you think about these people and how they're coming at Jesus and how they're coming, I mean, this is God, right? It's nothing less, less than the God-man, Jesus, and this is how they're treating him. And I just want to remind you that that was either us, it was either us, or it is us still. It, it, it either was you at one time, and now you've been reconciled to God, or you haven't been because you haven't given your life to Jesus, and, and this is you. Like, when you think about Romans chapter 3, and it's talking about all have turned away, and, and you know, uh, their talk is foul, and they rush to commit murder, and they don't know where to find peace, and they have no fear of God. I think a lot of times, if I asked you guys, I'd go, you know, who do you think of? When you think of that, you think of people against other people. But really, that's not what it's talking about first and foremost. It's talking about our treatment and our abuse of God. That if all sin is against God, like that's what Romans 3 is talking about, how we've abused God. So we would all be these people with torches. You know, this is what it looks like to turn your own way, to be in rebellion against God, and then it goes down to Romans 3, you know, chapter chapter 3, verses 23 and 24, and goes, uh, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and I don't know what you got for Christmas, but the free gift that God gave was his son, so that we could be made right with him through the death of Jesus on the cross. And, and so there's no other gift that you could possibly need as you sit here right now. Really praying that the cross sinks deep into your heart tonight. Because it's so easy to get to this place where you're just, you know, you're not always just thinking about the cross and you're not always just <coughs> thankful for the cross. And, and yesterday I, I wasn't feeling well, but I was like, you know, I'm going to start to pray through this message. And as I started to just pray through this and looked at how Jesus stepped into the cross, I, I just, all I did was cry a lot. I just cried and I cried and I cried some more. And, and then I thought, like, I'm done crying. I thought, you know, I should probably cry some more because I don't want to cry tonight while I was here, you know. And, and so I'm just praying that you guys have that same experience, that, that the, the cross sinks deep, deep into your heart. That when you leave here tonight and you go back to the house that you're staying at and you lay in bed, that you just sit there and think about how thankful you are for the cross, how grateful you are for the cross. That even though our talk has been fouled against God, that even though we rush to commit his murder and nail him to the cross, and all have fallen short, all of us, of the glory of God, that he loved you so much that he died for you so you could be made right with him. So I, I, really, I really just hope and pray that you leave here tonight thankful for the cross. If that's the only thing that would happen, if that's the only thing that would need to happen, that you would just be so thankful for the cross, that you'd have this renewed sense of, of joy for the cross, that you'd remember, like, oh, that's the reason that I even know what life is, because of Jesus' death on the cross. All right. So as we get into uh, the message here, uh, Jesus along the way here in John, uh, made several I am statements. Most people say that there's seven of them, right? Um, I believe that they're all leading up to this moment right here where Jesus makes an eight. Uh, the, the NLT will translate it, I am he, but the original translation is just I am. The original translation in Greek is I am. And so, you know, Jesus makes all these I am statements as we head through John. He says, I am the bread of life. He's telling us, I'm the nourishment for your soul. I'm the light of the world. If you ask the world, uh, what's the light of the world? They would say the sun. Jesus would say, no, I put that there. I put that there to, to govern the daytime. I'm the gate or the door, uh, uh, Jesus is saying. I'm the way for you to come into my sheepfold, to be one of my children. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the one who will guide you and feed you and care for you and protect you. I am the resurrection. Jesus boldly says, I am eternal life. 
just think of that right now. But because of the cross, you have eternal life. That's something that the world loves to make movies about. That's our reality as Christians. When's the last time you just really sat back and were like, just, just thrilled about the fact that you have eternal life? See, when you do that, you won't be worried about anything else. When you actually sit and meditate on the fact that, like, oh my gosh, like, I believe, I really believe in Jesus, and so I'll live forever. This isn't all there is. This is just temporary. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and life. That He is the only way to God. He is the truth of who God is, and He is the life of God. And then He says, I am the true vine. That He is the source of the source of all things, the source of experiencing the character of Jesus in our lives. But all these are just details. All these are leading up to this moment where Jesus makes this statement when they come with, with torches and lanterns and weapons. And Jesus says, who are you looking for? And they say, Jesus. And Jesus says, I am. All leading up to this moment where he makes this statement, I am. That, that is the name that God has given himself. It means I exist. It, it means I am existence. Right? We learned in John chapter 1 that he is the subject of all creation. Who Jesus is, he is I am. He is God. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the first and the last. Everything was created through him. Nothing was created except through him. He created everything that we see. Look around. Everything that you see. He created everything that we see. And he created things, countless things, that we cannot see. Such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in an unseen world, in heavenly places. Everything he created is for him. And he created all things because he created what he pleased. Right now he sits on a throne above all thrones. And he's sustaining everything. That breath you just took. That, that your eyes just blinked. All of it. He's sustaining everything by his mighty commands. Uh, things that we take for granted. Like gravity. The fact that you don't float away. right? It says that he, he made the laws of the universe and uses them. And so things that we take for granted, like gravity, uh, animals that have instincts, they're not just randomly like that. He made them like that. The things that we think are so random, like rain and lightning, it says he shouts to the clouds and it rains. It says he causes lightning to appear in the sky and he directs where it will hit. See, there's no <laughs> such thing as coincidence. Everything is under his power. <coughs> it's really important that you understand that because if you don't understand this and you don't understand this is who Jesus is, then you don't understand the gravity of what's happening in this moment. This is what it means to be the king of all kings, the king that makes kings, to be the lord of all lords, the master that makes masters. And this is why when Jesus says, I am, everybody draws back and falls. Because in a moment where it would look like he's out of control, he's letting us all know, no, I'm still in control. So don't we will force Jesus to go to the cross. He goes uh, as a sacrifice. He goes by his own will. He's in complete control all the time. Even right now, whatever you got going on when you came in here, he is in complete control. Now, that should bring a lot of you guys security and comfort. That he is actively willing it, allowing it, but always using it, whatever it is. Whatever it is. And that's what's happening here in John 18. Now, for some of us, we don't like that. Some of us thinking about that right now, that Jesus is in complete control. And he's actively willing, allowing, but using all things doesn't really make you happy. 
And, and that's because of rebellion against God. That's because we start to think of foolish ideas of what God to be like. <coughs> we start to think that we know how to do things better, yet Psalm 119 verse 68 says, God is good and he only does good. And so if you find yourself in a position right now where you're going, well, hold on, God's in complete control. Jesus is on the throne and, and everything is in the palm of his hand and he's in control. And I don't like where things are. It's because you think that you could do them better. And it's because you don't trust that he's good and that he only does what's good. But that's what's happening here in John chapter 18. Jesus is in complete control. He is God, the Alpha and the Omega, like I just said. And he realizes everything that's going to happen to him. It says that, he says in verse 4, he, fu he fully realized, Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him. And so he didn't run away. And so he didn't try to negotiate. Jesus fully realized everything that was going to happen to him. And he stepped forward to meet them. And he stepped into it. And, and listen, he didn't just realize it at this moment. It's not like Jesus here, fully God, is going, oh, I, I kind of see what's about to happen now. No, Jesus realized everything that was going to happen to him before he laid the foundations of the earth. See, that changes things a little bit. Before he even spoke and made the world, before he created one person, he knew what it would cost, and he did it anyway. So he stepped into it from the moment that he created, not from the moment that he entered his creation. Since before he laid the foundations of the earth, he knew all, he realized fully what would happen to him, all that would happen to him. And he did it anyway. Every miracle, everything that he's done here in the book of John has pointed to the cross where he would step into our brokenness and redeem it. We see it where he stepped into our wilderness when he was baptized. In John chapter 1, we see it where he stepped into our hidden sin and our shame when he confronts the woman at the well. We see it where he steps into our brokenness uh, in John chapter 5, where, where he goes up to the man on the mat who's been there 38 years. We see it where he steps into our sexual sin and our guilt in John chapter 8 with the woman caught in adultery. He steps into our darkness in John chapter 9. With the man born blind, steps into our lostness as the good shepherd in John chapter 10. <clears throat> he steps into our fear and our hurt when it comes to death in John chapter 11, where Jesus says, I am the resurrection. He steps into our filth in John chapter 13, where he washes our feet. And he steps into our worthlessness in John chapter 15, just to name a few, where he says, I'm the vine. And apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus just isn't out there floating somewhere. He is boots on the ground. He says, when you walk through deep waters, I am with you. This is what this is all about, that God is with us. That Jesus is in the pit and he's lifting us out of it. That he's in the mud and the muck and the filth. And he's not worried about getting his hands dirty. In fact, that's why he came. And so he fully realized all that was going to happen to him. He knew every mocking word that everybody would say to him and about him. He knew about every drop of spit that would hit his face. He knew about every knuckle that would hit him in the face. And every hair that would be ripped out of his face. He knew about every piece of lead that would rip the flesh from his body as they whipped him. He knew about every thorn that would push into his skull as they pushed it down, a crown of thorns on his head. And he knew about every nail and every jolt that would happen as they hammered nails into his hands 
and his feet. He fully realized everything that would happen to him at the cross. And he stepped into it. Why? So you would know and experience life. So you would know and experience love. So that you would know and experience him. You have no idea what those things are apart from that. You don't even know what life is without the cross. Without knowing Jesus. You can't know Jesus without the cross. You have no idea what love is. You have no way to give it, receive it, to even know. Because love is who God is. You have to experience Him. And that's why. And some of y'all sitting here right now think you've done some crazy things for what you think love is. And He's a jealous God. And He's jealous about His relationship with you. I know a bunch of you guys sitting here right now aren't able to comprehend that. And it's because you're so busy looking at yourself. But it's not based on you. It's true. That Jesus is jealous about his relationship with you. And it's because it's based on him. And who he is. If some of you guys would just believe that... Everything would change. So if you guys believe in Jesus and yet you still don't believe that he's jealous about a relationship with you. You look at the cross and you think that must have been for somebody else. You look at the cross and you think that covers some of the stuff you did, but it couldn't possibly cover all of it. And yet Jesus knew everything about you before he even created you. And he stepped into it. He stepped into the cross so that you would know him. He doesn't want you to just be close to him, just in the vicinity. He wants you to be one with him. That you would have his heart. That you would have his desires, that you would have his thoughts, that you would have his words, that all day you would be able to drink, drink deeply from the fountain of salvation with joy and rivers of living water would burst from your heart. This is why Jesus Realized all that would happen to him. And he stepped into it. And listen, he didn't just realize all that would happen to him, but all that would happen to you. That when Jesus said it is finished on the cross, that it would be the end of our sin and our shame, and it would be the beginning of actual life for you. <coughs> He realized the joy that lied ahead and that because of his sacrifice, because of the anguish that he would endure, that he would see what would happen to you and he would be satisfied. The creator of the universe who needs nothing, who is lacking nothing, looked ahead into the future and saw what would happen to you, that you would be transformed, that you would have new life. That because of his sacrifice, that many would be counted righteous, and he would be satisfied. He would delight in that. That he would delight in you. He realized all that would happen to him. This included the empty tomb. And the resurrection. 
that would bring eternal life. This included that he would be seated on the throne in the place of honor at God's right hand with all authority in heaven and on earth, making all things new. He realized that at the perfect time, the perfect time, his time, he would return and all things wouldn't be being made new anymore, but they would be made new. That he would reign and rule with you forever on a new heaven and a new earth. See, when you've been raised from the dead and you've been raised to new life through the power of the Holy Spirit, and it's truly no longer you who lives, but Jesus who lives in us, we get to enjoy the same comfort and the same encouragement and the same security as realizing all that will happen to us. And then we too will step into it. Compelled by the Holy Spirit. See, the proof that the miracle has happened in your life, that the Holy Spirit has actually transformed you and made you a new creation, is that because Jesus gave his life for you, you no longer live for yourself, but you live for Jesus. That Jesus' love controls you. This is the proof of new life, that you have been saved from the pit and the mud and the mire and the filth in the quicksand, and now you step into the pit and the mud and the mire and the filth to save others. See, Peter in verse 10 reacts like somebody who doesn't realize all that will happen to them. He pulls out a sword, he cuts off someone's ear, he reacts like somebody who doesn't realize all that will happen to them. Don't be misled or misguided here. What he did was not strong. What he did was not bold. What he did was out of fear. He wasn't willing to die for Jesus. He pulled out a sword to try to avoid death. He doesn't step into it. He fights to avoid it. And he takes matters into his own hands. Listen, God is literally standing right next to him. You ever been facing a situation and been like, man, I really wish I could just ask God for the answer? God is standing right next to him, and he takes matters into his own hands and doesn't just ask Jesus what he should do. Even worse, he doesn't just follow him and his leading. And yet those of us who believe in Jesus don't have Jesus standing right next to them, but living in us. God is literally living in us, and still so often we try to take things into our own hands. <clears throat> so often we try to do things in our own strength. Some of you have been sword fighting through life, even after you've encountered Jesus. Constantly taking matters into your own hands instead of trusting the Spirit <coughs> and sprouting wings. One time I gave a message way back at the Knights of Columbus to say that. And uh, it, it was like when pigs fly. Right? Because that's always that's always what, you know, that's always what people say, right? When it's something impossible. Or, or they say, yeah, I'll do that when pigs fly, right? Or if pigs could fly. And it's always... A, a phrase that you use when you're saying it's impossible. And yet in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, the literal translation of that is those who trust in the Lord will sprout wings. See, pigs were the most filthy, nasty, unclean animal. If you even came near a pig, right, you weren't allowed to, to you were ceremonially unclean. And, and yet my point of that message was we were the pigs. We're the nasty, filthy, separated from God. And yet Jesus on the cross makes a way for us to be united with him. And when we trust in him, we actually sprout, sprout wings and fly in the spirit. It says you run and you don't grow weary. You have new strength. 
proof that pigs can fly. A whole room full of them here. <laughs> well, you weren't there in Akron when we were maggots, so. <laughs> Listen, when we go off of what we can see instead of what we can't see, that's when we take matters into our own hands. And you know what will happen if you continually take matters into your own hands? Eventually, you'll give up. Eventually, you'll grow weary. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 says this. This is why we never give up. Right there it is. That though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and what? Lasts forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. There should be two effects that present trouble have on a Christian. Two effects, at least in this passage, that, that having present troubles should have on somebody who has the Holy Spirit living inside of them. One, it should remind us to fix our gaze on what we can't see. See, we can rejoice now when troubles come. They're a reminder that what's here is temporary, what's here is small. So why do we spend so much time looking at the trouble? It should remind us to fix our gaze on what can't be seen. And it should bring in excitement. Because there's an eternal glory to come that will last forever. But if you rely on your own understanding, you will be fighting against God's will. Just like Peter here. This is what Jesus says to him. He goes, should I not drink from the cup of suffering that God has given me? Should I fight against what God wants? But if you rely on your own understanding, if you take matters into your own, if you just focus on what you can't see, and you won't fix your gaze on what can't be seen, You'll react the same way. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says that because of the divine power, because of the Holy Spirit living in us, that we've been given everything we need to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. That what? We've received all this by what? Coming to know him. Now you see the importance of where Jesus was like, yes, I stepped into it so that you would know me, so that you could receive the divine power to have everything you need to live a godly life because of what Jesus has done on the cross, that the Holy Spirit enables you to live like Jesus. Everything you need to step into the godly life that Jesus has called you to. The divine power, his divine power through the Holy Spirit. And listen, if you don't, if you don't step into it, you're wasting your life. Living your life for anything other than Jesus and the gospel is a waste of your life. Period. There's no easier way to say that. You know, I just think, you know, when, when Mary comes in and she's crying at Jesus' feet, and she's just down on her knees, just crying at Jesus' feet and wiping his feet with her hair. And it's because what Jesus goes, she's been forgiven so much that she loves much. And yet I think to myself, you think anybody had to like talk Mary into doing that? You think anybody had to convince her that she should go do that? They had to beg Mary, you know what you should do? You should go thank Jesus. You should go get at Jesus' feet and cry. It's like, no, it was an overflow of the Spirit from being forgiven so much 
And she was so thankful for Jesus. And she was just at his feet crying. And I just think sometimes we find ourselves trying to convince people. Like it's hard to convince somebody to even meditate, spend some time with Jesus. You don't want to get out of bed early and spend time with Jesus. You, and it's like, I feel like I got to talk people into it sometimes. And in the traditional church, it's like, you got 35 minutes, Jesus, to talk to us. Right? We got stuff to do. And I'm just like, and we're trying to cram everything into an hour and a half. Like, well, let's sing really quick and let's do some songs and maybe we'll throw some communion in there. You know, but yet the people in the book of Acts that really received the Holy Spirit were devoted to these things. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to the Word of God. They were devoted to eating and fellowship together. They were devoted to communion. It was special. It was special. Nobody had to convince them. Nobody had to talk them into it. You had to talk him into doing something else. They were so devoted to Jesus. It was like uh, other things you would have to get their attention away from Jesus. You would have to try to distract them probably. Nobody had to beg Mary to go cry at Jesus' feet. It's the reality of the Holy Spirit doing a miracle inside of you, transforming you into a new creation. And you just have this love for Jesus. And you don't care about the other things. And you would rather just sit and read this for hours than, than just hear a message once a week for a few <coughs> minutes here or there or a couple times. It's like, that, that's all good. That's devoted to the apostles' teaching. But like, this is the word of God. And I just think of, we're trying to convince people to love Jesus. Peter received the, the, the fullness of the Holy Spirit and, and he fully realized all that was going to happen to him and he stepped into it after he received the Holy Spirit. You see, Peter here fights to not be, right? And then he denies Jesus and then he receives the Holy Spirit and he completely understands this miracle of the Holy Spirit happens to him. He fully realizes all that's going to happen to him and you just see him living the God, he's the one that the Holy Spirit wrote that through in 2 Peter, where he's like, you've been given everything you need to live this godly life, to just step into this godly life and live like Jesus. And you see it happening, just like Jesus goes up to the paralyzed man on the mat in John 5. You see uh, Peter walking up to a, a blind beggar or a crippled beggar in Acts chapter 3, same way, and going, I'm not going to give you what you want or what you think you need. I'm going to give you what you really need. I'm going to give you Jesus. I'm going to give you the gospel. I'm going to give you life. <clears throat> In Acts chapter 5, you see him beaten and rejoicing, running down the street, rejoicing to be counted worthy to get beaten like Jesus. And you just, like, think about that for a minute. Him and John are just running down the street like, can you believe we just got beat like Jesus? <laughs> they were so excited. They were looking up for just like Jesus. <laughs> He was their hero. They loved him so much. And then he would step into his own cross upside down. Stephen received the Holy Spirit. He, he was known as a man filled with the Holy Spirit. He fully realized all that was going to happen to him, right? And he stepped into it. His face lit up like an angel in Acts chapter 6 and in chapter 7. And he steps into the self-righteousness and the pride of the religious leaders. And as they rush to stone him, he could stop speaking. But instead of that, he steps into it, compelled by the Holy Spirit. And he looks up and he sees the heavens part. And he goes, I see Jesus sitting in the place of honor. I see Jesus on the throne. Impacts Paul, at the time he was Saul, in such a way that the Holy Spirit writes through him later in Colossians chapter 3, where he goes, stay focused on the realities of heaven and not the things of this earth. He saw what it looked like. Stephen stepped into a stoning and stepped into eternity with Jesus, and he was dangerous to the kingdom of darkness in his death because the gospel spread, and here we are. That's powerful. 
Paul and Silas step into their missionary journey filled with the Holy Spirit, fully realizing all that's going to happen to them. And they step into it. And in Acts chapter 16, they step into this girl's demonic possession. And they set her free through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the result is they're severely beaten and locked down in a dungeon. And they stepped into it and sang hymns to Jesus at midnight while other prisoners listened. Later, Paul would step onto the chopping block and have his head cut off for Jesus. But immediately, he would step into eternity and perfection with Jesus. Let me ask you, you think you deserve a better life than that? Anybody sitting here tonight that claims to be a follower of Jesus, you think you deserve a better life than them? These guys were so in love with Jesus. These guys were so sold out for Jesus. You look at these guys and you think, what, like, they did that so you could, what? Live the American dream? Lots of people doing that apart from Jesus. So often we think, we look at this and we, like, I don't think we realize it. We think we somehow deserve some better earthly life than them. Or that's why they died. They didn't die so you could cling to this life and try and find joy in this life. They died so you would know that there's a joy that far outseed, uh, uh, supersedes, exceeds this life. That there's a joy and a treasure in Jesus that you don't need anything else. You don't need anything down here. That you won't try to find joy in anything or anyone down here. That Jesus is that awesome. That he is the treasure. He is joy. He used both their lives and their deaths to advance the kingdom of God. So that many, some of us sitting in this room right now, could be counted as righteous. Jesus wants us to be people that walk out of this book. I don't care what country we're in. <clears throat> he wants us to be people that step out of this book and step into it. That we step into the mission that Jesus has called us to. So that many others can be counted righteous. That as we pray right now, that we would take it serious, that, that we get to enter into the throne room. Because of what Jesus has done, right? Because he's our high priest and he understands our weaknesses and he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So he understands your weaknesses right now in this moment, yet he faced them all and he overcame them. So that he could live in you and so could you. You've been given everything in the Holy Spirit to live a life, a godly life, in Jesus. We can't, we can't just continue sitting back and acting like we need Jesus to do something else. But we need to step into it and experience the power of the Holy Spirit. To step forward in faith and unleash the power of the Holy Spirit. So because of what Jesus has done, because he lives in us, we can boldly come to the throne of our gracious God and receive his mercy and find the grace we need to help us most so that we can step in to what Jesus has called us to. <coughs> we would be people who step into the muck and the mire and the filth and the quicksand with people to save them. Pulling people from the pit. Making disciples. It's a real thing. Entering into the throne room right now. It was real. When we were singing to Jesus. This all powerful being. Sitting on the throne right now. Receiving <coughs> the worship of heaven. And we've been invited to be a part of that. 
We've been invited uh, to allow Jesus to use our lives, even our deaths, some of us sitting in this room, so that many could be counted righteous. Let's pray.